How do you analyze hearsay under the federal rules on an evidence essay? Well, from a big picture perspective, hearsay is actually a pretty straightforward analysis, right? We all know what the starting point rule is. Hearsay evidence is inadmissible unless an exception applies. And in fact, I could probably walk out on the street right now and ask any random passerby whether or not hearsay evidence is admissible, and most would likely be able to articulate the rule correctly. Hearsay is not allowed in court. So the analysis is actually pretty straightforward. I know a lot of times law students like to make a hearsay analysis more convoluted than it has to be, but at its core, there's only two parts, right? Number one, is this piece of evidence hearsay? And number two, if it is, is there an exception that allows this hearsay evidence to come into court? That's all it is, two parts. Again, number one, is this piece of evidence hearsay? And number two, if it is, is there an exception that would allow this hearsay evidence to come into court? So in today's video, we just wanna focus on part one of the hearsay analysis. How do you determine whether a piece of evidence is hearsay? And fortunately for us, under the federal rules of evidence, rule 801, C, it tells us exactly what hearsay is. And 801D tells us exactly what hearsay is not. So the rule lays it out very clearly for us, and that's just what we wanna go over in today's video. Especially, we wanna focus on 801C to really gain an understanding of what hearsay is. And in part two, in our next video, we'll go deeper into 801D and talk about some situations where 801C might be met but it's still not going to be considered hearsay under 801D. But let's focus on 801C for now. What is hearsay? Hearsay is an out of court statement that is offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. This is the definition you're going to hear from any evidence law professor, any attorney. This is the standard definition for hearsay. Hearsay is an out of court statement that is offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted in that statement. And I like to tell law students to think about this definition in terms of three elements. Number one, we need an out of court, an out of court. Number two, we need statement. We need an out of court statement. And number three, that is offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. So you, again, you can think about this definition of hearsay in terms of three elements. An out of court statement that is offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted in this statement. Okay, so we'll look at some examples in a minute, but let's break down each of these elements a little bit. So what does it mean to be out of court? You should literally think about this element as the four walls of the courtroom we're sitting in today at this trial. You should think about the box that is the courtroom and any statement that's being made outside of this box that is the courtroom that we're sitting in right now in today's trial is going to be considered out of court. So what if a statement is made in the hallway outside the four walls of the courtroom? Is that out of court? Yes. What if it's made in a different courtroom down the hall? Is that out of court? Yes. What if it was made inside this box, but it was six months ago in a different case? Is that out of court? Yes. Remember, this is a time and space test. We're talking about in the four walls of this court today in this trial, right? So even if it was made in this courtroom, but it was made in a different case, six months ago or two years ago, it's gonna fail that time requirement, right? So it's a time and space requirement when we're thinking about out of court statements. Okay, so what is a statement? A statement is an assertion that is made by a human being. And this can be oral, right? And this is the classic example that most of us think about when we think about hearsay. We think about oral statements. But of course, an assertion by a human being can be written, it could be a letter, a postcard, a text message, an email, a fax, a memorandum that's sent out to the company, right? And it can even be nonverbal. Nonverbal conduct can be assertive in nature, right? Which would constitute a statement for 801C purposes. Think about a 
head nod or a head shake or a thumbs up or a thumbs down. All of these can be assertions that are made even with no voice, even if they're not written down. Nonverbal conduct, as long as it's assertive, can be a statement for hearsay purposes. So we have a general understanding of what an out of court statement is, right? Anything outside of the four walls of the courtroom that is an assertion being made by a human being. Of course, too, what about a dog barking or a fax machine whirring or the sound that a machine makes, right? When you turn it on or something like that. Is any of that an assertion made by a human being? No, right? Sounds made by machines or animals is not going to be an assertion made by a human being. It's not going to count as an out of court statement for hearsay purposes, right? So that's pretty much all that we need to know for an out of court statement though. These two elements are pretty easy to identify. To be out of court, remember, think about the four walls of the courtroom that we're sitting in today, that box, and a statement is just an assertion that is made by a human being. But what does it mean to be an out of court statement that is offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted? This is the trickiest part of understanding what hearsay is. This third element of what it means to be offered to prove the truth of the matter that is asserted in this statement. Okay, so the best way to think about this is probably to look at some examples. So let's start with something very easy. Let's say that you and I are talking and it's not on video camera. We're sitting in the same room and we're having a conversation and I look at you and I say, this dry erase marker is red. I am 100% confident that this dry erase marker is red. Even though it's clearly blue, right? We all know that this is a blue dry erase marker. For this example, let's say I'm 100% convicted and I'm telling you that this dry erase marker is red. Well, let's say that later on I end up being a witness in a hit and run car accident case. And a detail of this case that matters is what color a stoplight was, right? And I'm testifying that the light was red or green or yellow. It doesn't matter what right if you're offering my statement in a future date that to show that this my statement remember that this dry erase marker is red if you want to prove at a future trial that this dry erase marker was red right and you want to do that by using my statement well that's an out of court statement right it's an out of court it's out of the four walls of the courtroom it's an oral assertion so it's a statement and if you're offering my statement that the dry erase marker is red to prove the color of this dry erase marker you're offering that to prove the truth of the matter asserted that this dry erase marker is red you're using my statement to prove the truth of the statement right okay but now compare that to remember we're brave. We want to say we want to attack my credibility as a witness. I'm colorblind. Obviously, I'm calling this dry erase, just dry erase marker red. Say that the defendant wants to attack my credibility. They want to say, hey, this guy can't tell colors apart. He's not bringing in this statement. He wants to bring in my statement to you of me saying that this dry erase marker is red. He's not bringing it in because he cares about the color of the marker. He cares about my ability to see colors, right? I'm testifying that the light was red when he ran it, right? So he's saying, look, this guy can't tell what color a marker is. We don't care what color the marker was. All we care about is he's colorblind, right? He's not a credible witness. So that's the difference that we're focusing on when we're talking about the truth of the matter asserted. If you're bringing that statement in to actually show what color this marker was, you're bringing that in for the truth of the matter asserted. But if you're doing it for any other reason, maybe to talk about my state of mind, hey, clearly this guy's a crazy person. He thinks that his dry erase marker is red when it's clearly blue, or you're doing it to attack my credibility. You're saying he can't see anything. He has serious sensory incompetence. His eyes don't work. He's not a credible witness. He can't recall the facts correctly, right? Any of that, you're not offering it to prove whether or not this dry erase marker is blue. No one cares about that. You're offering it for some other reason. So what other reasons other than the truth are common examples, right? Well, there's four that are commonly tested and you want to be aware of. Number one, 
we have statements, say statements that are offered to show the effect, the effect on the listener. Let's say number two, we have statements that are offered to show the declarant's state of mind. The declarant's state of mind. Number three or C, we have statements that are offered for impeachment purposes. So impeachment purposes. And finally, we have statements that have independent legal significance. So independent legal significance. Significance. Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as verbal acts, but it's statements that themselves have independent legal significance. So let's run through each of these to offer up some examples and really flesh out this third element as to what is a statement that's being offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. So what is a good example for effect on the listener? Let's say that me, I'm walking down the street with my buddy and we're having a normal conversation. And let's say out of nowhere, my buddy yells, look out, a bird is about to attack you. So I react to this, he shouts this out of nowhere. So I immediately flinch and try to get away from this bird. And as I flail, let's say I hit a small child that's next to me. And let's say this child sustains injury and eventually I'm sued, right? For either battery or who knows, negligence the assault on this child that I've hit by flailing my arms, right? So let's say that I want to introduce that statement from my buddy to show the effect on me, the listener. Let's say that I want to introduce my buddy's statement that there was a bird about to attack me, right? Am I introducing that statement because we care about whether or not there was a bird flying around. Or am I introducing that statement to show that statement caused me to flail. That's what caused me to hit this child, right? I'm not offering this statement to prove the truth of the matter as to whether or not a bird was actually attacking me. We don't care whether a bird was there or not. That has nothing to do with why we are bringing this statement in. We're bringing this statement in to show that it caused me to flail and hit the child. So sometimes another good thing to remember here, and I'll briefly write, a good test to make a determination to this third element is the do we care test. Do we care whether this statement is true or false? So I'll just write that here. The do we care test. Do we care whether the statement is true or false? So in that example, do we care whether there was a bird flying around or not? Do we care whether that statement is true or false? No, we're not introducing it to say there was a bird. We're introducing it to show the effect on me, the listener, okay? So that's effect on the listener. Another common example where we're not offering a statement to prove the truth of the matter asserted, we're offering the statement to show the declarant state of mind. Um, and obviously here, declarant is the person who is making the out of court statement, right? So the main two parties here in a hearsay analysis, you're going to have a declarant. The declarant is the person who made the out of court statement and the witness is the person in the four corners of the courtroom sitting there testifying to that out of court statement. Important to recognize of course that the declarant and the witness can be the same person, right? But that's the declarant, that's the witness. The declarant was the person who declared the statement, who made the statement out of court. The witness is in the courtroom today testifying to that out of court statement. So a statement that's being offered, an out of court statement that's being offered to show the declarant's state of mind is not being offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. So what would this be? This could kind of be like my first example where I was talking about the dry erase marker and I'm saying this dry erase marker is red and it's really blue. You might introduce that to show that me, the declarant, is clearly out of his mind. Another common example of this, the classic you'll hear is, imagine that I'm out of court 
and I'm telling a bunch of people that I'm the king of England. And let's say that I really believe that I'm the king of England. I put on my crown and my big robe and I walk around and I tell everyone, hey, look, I'm the king of England and I believe it, right? And let's say that I end up being an important witness at some trial. And let's say that some either party wants to talk about my state of mind. And they want to bring in these out of court statements that I was going around telling people that I was the king of England. Well, those are out of court statements, but are they offering those statements to prove whether or not I'm actually the king of England? No, no one cares. The do we care test. Do we care whether I'm the king or England, uh, whether I'm the king of England or not? Do we care whether that statement is true or false? No, that's not why the party is introducing these out of court statements of me saying I'm the king of England. They're introducing the statements to show that I'm a crazy person. I'm out of my mind. They're introducing it to show the declarant's state of mind, me, the declarant, right? Impeachment purposes is actually pretty similar to the declarant's state of mind. Um, and this is what we talked about at the beginning too. Imagine that you want to bring in out of court statements to attack the witness's credibility. In evidence, when we talk about impeachment, we're talking about attacking a witness's credibility. Okay, so for impeachment purposes, the classic example here would be a police interrogation. Let's say that a witness, a key witness to a murder is recounting the events that led up to the murder and the murder itself. Um, to a police officer in an interrogation room. And typically what's going to happen in interrogations, they're very long, very detailed. You don't do it all in one sitting. It can be you know, two or three sittings or four or five, I don't know fully how investigations work, but it's gonna be multiple interrogations of the same witness in a murder trial, right? So let's say that we have interrogation A, and the witness during interrogation A gives one story and then time passes and we have interrogation B. And some things that were story A change when we get to story B, right? So what will happen commonly at trial, this is ripe ground for a defendant, right? If we have a witness who's saying they saw the defendant commit the crime, the defense is going to want to attack that witness's credibility as much as possible. So if we have multiple police interrogations, which are going to be full of out of court statements, both oral and written, right? Oftentimes these things are documented and written down. So we have lots of oral and written statements that are being made out of court. The defense is going to want to show all of the inconsistencies, right? All of the changes that happened from story A to story B to say, hey, look, this witness isn't credible, right? Look how much the story changed. Either this witness can't recall the details correctly, their memory is flawed, or they're a liar, right? Either way, we're attacking the witness's credibility. Do we care? We don't care about story A and B, whether or not those are true. That's not why we're introducing these statements. We're introducing the statements to show, to impeach the witness, to show that this credibility of this witness may not be very strong, right? And this too is going to often be called prior inconsistent statements. That's where you're gonna hear this idea. And we'll talk more about this when we get to 801D because there's some special rules to consider for prior inconsistent statements. Prior inconsistent statements. But we'll come back to this in our next video. All you need to realize here is if you're offering a out of court statement to prove the truth of the matter asserted, again, that's going to be hearsay. But if you're offering it to impeach a witness, you don't care whether the statement is true or false, you're introducing that out of court statement to impeach the witness, whether that be through prior inconsistent statements or otherwise, then that is not hearsay under 801C because you're not offering that statement to prove the truth of the matter asserted. Okay, one more really quick that we wanna talk about here is gonna be statements that have independent legal significance. This is generally why contracts and last wills and testaments are admissible in court. Anytime you have a assertion, a statement, an out of court statement, whether that's oral, written, nonverbal, that's attaching legal rights or liabilities to it, or goes directly to an element of a claim or defense that's being asserted, 
then it's going to have that statement has independent legal significance so it's going to be allowed to come in in a will contest for example imagine that somebody's challenging the validity of a will well we have to see that will right in a contest even though it's full of written assertions that were made out of court we have to have that will in a will contest that will attaches all kinds of legal rights and liabilities to it. The statements made in that will have independent legal significance, so it's not going to be considered hearsay. Think about a lawsuit like defamation or bribing a public official, right? If we're charging a defendant with bribing a public official, we're going to have to bring in his out-of-court statements that were the bribes to prove that he bribed a public official, right? We have out-of-court statements that were bribes, oral assertions likely that were made out of court but those have to come in because those bribes themselves the bribes are out of court statements that have independent legal significance you would also have defamatory statements and a defamation action anytime a statement has independent legal significance that is affecting another person's rights or liabilities like a contract or a last will and testament or threats right anything that could be going to an element of the claim or defense like a defamation lawsuit or bribing a public official right all independent legal significance not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted they're being introduced because those statements themselves the words that constitute those statements have independent legal significance but that's everything we need to know for understanding under 801c what hearsay is it's simply an out-of-court statement that's being offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted so if all three of these elements are met we know under 801c that we have hearsay all that's left is going to be looking at 801d and making sure that that statement doesn't fall under an enumerated category under 801d if it doesn't then we know we have hearsay and the only part left of our analysis is going to be checking for exceptions so we'll talk more about 801d in our next video and that's going to be very important do not skip that because we'll find that sometimes even if all three of these elements are met if that statement falls under a category enumerated under 801d it's still not going to be considered hearsay so very important we understand 801d as well as 801c but we'll get into that in our next video but until then guys i wish you all the absolute best i hope this video was helpful and i'll see you at our next video